a, a Japanese Shinto community came over and did a great offering of uh, vegetables on the high altar of the cathedral. And I caught hell from various Episcopal <laughs> clergy in the diocese. And they went to the bishop and they said, we're going to have to reconsecrate the cathedral because the altar has been <laughs> profaned by pagan rituals. And then I really got wild when that happened. And I said to a couple of people, I went, what in the hell do they mean? It's been God's altar has been profaned. How can a rutabaga, this is my famous statement, how can a rutabaga profane God's altar? He made the rutabaga, and it was being offered. Well, Mr. Deguchi, who was the head of this religious community, st stood up and said, I want to thank you so much, this is in Japanese, for your hospitality last year when we were here and had the exhibition. But I want to thank you most of all for your allowing us to have our ritual in the cathedral, our Shinto ritual at the high altar. It was so beautiful and it, it meant everything to us. And therefore, then he stood up and he took out of his long sleeves um, a little envelope and he said, my wife and I would be most grateful if you next year would come to Japan and do the Christian ritual in our Shinto shrine. And here are the tickets. Well, I had a heart attack. Well, we did it the next year, and we had the Book of Common Prayer ritual in the Shinto shrine. That is what made me see that an interfaith plunge <laughs> into really into the essence of another religious structure not just reading about it, but truly experiencing it, was what changes your whole perception of that religion, your perception of your own religion, your perception of how different religions um, can understand each other. And that Japanese experience is what changed my life. It's hard to say when interfaith in my life began because I grew up in a university community. My father was a professor, and there were always students in the house. For two summers, while I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I was a counselor at a Jewish camp. We, of course, you know, we had, had the, the blessing. And so I, I didn't have a yarmulke, so we put our hands on our head. And, uh, and the guys together said, listen, are you Jewish <laughs> or not? And I said, no, I'm not. He said, good, I, we didn't think you were. <laughs> and so that, that, that was a rather significant interfaith experience of an early nature. The very first job I had after being ordained in 1954 was in a very, very poor parish in Jersey City. Then it was full of very, very recently come um, sharecroppers from from the south. And so this little Episcopal church, which had sort of seven white people left, opened its doors and became a, a, a parish of, of really of the community. And then I went and spent another eight years with my family in Chicago. But it really, really began at the cathedral. In the 25 year period, that I was the dean there, and that was, that's a very big New York institution. One of the things I really tried to do there was to open up that cathedral to the reality of New York City, which is not an Episcopal reality at all. I, I got consumed by the idea of making it possible for people from very different traditions, very different religions, very different ethnicities, um, very different understandings of who they were and what the world was, um, to, to, to respect each other because they're here together. And so I invited really the most interesting and distinguished, fascinating people I could find 
who were Hindus and who were Jews and who were Muslims and who were Buddhists um, to be in the pulpit of the cathedral. So for which, I must say, I got a lot of hell. I got a lot of criticism. People saying, well, this is an Anglican cathedral. What are you doing having a rabbi in the pulpit? That kind of business. And uh, uh, but it also opened it up and people started coming here and feeling that no matter who they were and what they were from, this could be a, a, a real spiritual home for them. When I left the cathedral, I, I really knew that I wanted to do something that could make interfaith itself a, a, a living experience for, for everybody in their different religions. And so uh, <clears throat> that's what I, what I, with a small group of fellow criminals, created in, um, in, in 97. And we called it the Interfaith Center of New York because there, there wasn't such a thing. Uh, I always thinking if I'm gonna try to invite a Muslim or somebody, maybe they will not come because oh, they are not Buddhist. So I never tried. But in Interfaith Center, they invite. They are nothing to do with the religion. One time I asked, what do you do in the business? They said, education, to make a harmony, uh, another religion called uh, make harmony. I said, uh, that's a good idea. After that, I always, uh, in, uh, they invite me. I always cooperate with them. I was very extreme before Intercity Center because the Catholic Church made a lot of mess in my country. I was very excited in no Catholic church, no press, no, no Catholic priest. And after that, I, when I and get involved at the interface, I understand, I say, maybe I have to understand what they think about me, why they do this mess with my religion. And now I become friend with them, and I, we sit together and share. Well, the Interfaith Center, um, I told someone that if it, if it, was not established if it would, it would have to be invented because New York City is one of the more diverse uh, community cities in, in, the, in the world. And with all of these uh, faith traditions uh, interacting in a very small radius, without a lot of knowledge of each other, uh, it became important to be able to help people to understand uh, uh, different cultures, different uh, uh, faith traditions, and by the same uh, token, appreciate the struggle and the concern, the joint concerns that all people have. I would love to see the Interfaith grow, uh, Center grow uh, to the extent, uh, in my mind, it's already uh, on the cutting edge of interfaith work. As I said, I was involved in interfaith work for a couple of decades before the Interfaith Center uh, was formed. And I literally had to drop out because they amounted to, and I won't devalue you know, the value of conversation, but they stopped short of really concrete action. And that's exactly what the center does that's different. You know, the whole conversation is based on manifesting itself in action in the community that impacts people's lives. So I would love to see the Interfaith Center, uh, you know, uh, grow to such an extent that uh, they had headquarters about a block thick and wide, you know, so that many, many more people could benefit uh, from the incredible talent and imagination that resides, you know, in the Interfaith Center.